what am I doing different? Like nothing other than I am helping patients directly and I'm not participating in the triangular relationship that insurance wants us to participate in. Welcome to the Business of Healthcare podcast from the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management at the Naveen Jindal School of Management. Here at the University of Texas at Dallas, we bring together business leaders and other forward thinkers to discuss how best to meet the challenges of a rapidly changing, increasingly complex healthcare ecosystem. I'm Dr. Bob Kaiser, Director of the Master's Program in Healthcare Leadership and Management. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcasting app to ensure you don't miss any of the future episodes. You can also join us online at businessofhealthcarepodcast.com. Today's topic has many dimensions. We are talking physical therapy. I believe most people have heard of PT, physical therapy. Many of us have participated, but I'm not sure that most of us have a clear view of the practice, the goals, and how it's changing. With us today is Dr. Aaron LeBauer, author of Cash PT Blueprint, and the host of the Cash PT Lunch Hour podcast. Welcome to the Business of Healthcare podcast, Aaron. Hey, Bob. Thanks for having me on your show. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I think our discussion today is going to be revealing and quite educational. You are recognized as an international speaker and as a business coach who's helped thousands of passionate physical therapists scale their time, income, and impact without relying on insurance. That's the key word, without relying on insurance. So before we get into your personal story and the business strategy, Mm -hmm. let's clarify what a physical therapist is and also the term doctorate of physiotherapy. Yeah, I think the number one way to describe a physical therapist, it's hard. (laughs) So there's multiple. We do so much, and that's probably part of our downfall. Um, Physical therapists are experts in movement dysfunction um, or movement problems for the human body and even canines and animals. Um, So what do we do is um, we use our uh, evaluation technique to find out the root cause of the problem, and then we figure out which uh, treatment, whether it's a hands-on, an exercise, or education is required uh, for the patient to hit their goals, not just to move their body part or heal their injury. Um, I I told a couple people recently, it's like, I can't heal your arthritis, but I can help you play golf without pain, you know? So at the same time, I'm an orthopedic physical therapist. Um, They're physical therapists that do electrophysiology. They just study nerves and they do nerve studies. Uh, They're physical therapists that do wound care. They're physical therapists that specialize in women's health, uh, geriatrics, animals. Um, So we do so much, but in general, if you look at it, it's how do we optimize or make human movement better, but it's also helping people move through the world physically in a way that uh, allows them to do what they want um, without distraction. Very good. So I always, I always get to learn a lot by interviewing our guests. And so yeah. I was on the American Physical Therapy Association website. And I must say it was very rich with information and it had a lot of the facts and figures on it. So just to try to give a little scope on the size of this, and in a minute we'll talk about what's it take to become a physical therapist. But the, the, the website says there's 300,000 licensed physical therapists and another 125,000 licensed physical therapist assistants in the United States. Mm-hmm. I thought, wow, that's, that's, that's a pretty big, pretty big domain right there. And it said the, the median age is in the low 40s. Two-thirds are women, one-third men. Uh, they get paid pretty well, median salary in the high 80s. And it shows all the different you know, geography distributions. So... I was just thinking, comparing that to doctors, medical doctors, there's about a million active physicians in the United States. That's what they say. About 535,000 are specialists and, and 486,000 are what you call primary care docs. So the question is asked, if you have a doctorate of physiotherapy, are you guys called doctors? And is there competition or is there cooperation with the medical doctors? What's, what's your position on that? It's both. It's all in the above. But it's, we are doctors of physical therapy. The degree was first awarded, I think, 25 years ago. Now all physical therapy programs graduate, you know, doctors of physical therapy. And what that means is we have an advanced clinical doctorate in physical therapy. So do we call ourselves doctors? I do. 
Um, most people do. Some people are still a little hesitant because it's newer in a profession or they feel like it's an insult or confusing. I don't see it as that way. There's lots of doctors. There's people that are research scientists, PhDs. They're medical doctors. They're doctors of ophthalmology. There's veterinary doctors. There's doctors of everything. So we're a doctor, but it's how do I introduce myself um, and what's my scope of practice. I believe that a, a good doctor understands what they know and what they don't know. And so in that way, that allows for a collaboration with other professionals, whether they're a doctoring profession or not, it's what's best for our patients that matter. And if I don't know an answer to something, I'm going to go find someone who does. Well, I think that's the forward, uh, forward thinking approach to any situation is be transparent and, and be clear about mm -hmm. what you do and, and what you don't do. Um, I, I know that uh, the medical doctors, uh, there's different, different types, like you said. Um, they all seem to go through, you know, the same type of, of education, some undergraduate degree to get in the medical school, and then several years of medical school, maybe followed by, you know, a residency and then a fellowship. Does that take place in, in, the, um, in the world of therapists as well, physical therapists? It, it does. We do um, – we did a full – uh, cadaver lab. I mean, I did a six month cadaver lab, um, same as, uh, the medical school that, um, that are in my area. We've done, um, full biomechanics, anatomy, physiology, advanced clinical study research. I published a paper when I was in, when I was in uh, PT school. I did not do a, the residency or fellowship. I didn't do one of those. It's not really required to be a specialist. You can do those to be a specialist. And there's about 10 or 12 of them in physical therapy. Um, I, you know, I started my career as a massage therapist, so I already had better hands and tactile skills than most of the physical therapists I graduated with. Um, I went to school to learn um, the evaluation and prognosis, um, how do I diagnose movement uh, problems. And so you can do that, but you know, the sad thing is, Bob, uh, being a specialist in physical therapy and a, or a board-certified specialist doesn't um, allow you to generate more revenue or income. It's really more of like a, a would like to have um, insurance companies don't pay us more for being uh, specialty physical therapists. Okay. Well, that's a great point there. Uh, last question along that line, just to get clarity for our audience here. So um, I, I really like the way that you explain um, the responsibility and the depth and dimension of what a physical therapist does. You know, basically they, they get involved in, in a whole variety of um, requirements for educations. You have to have a license, right, to practice physical therapy? Yes, we are licensed in the state. So every state has its own license. There's a national, um, I think, certification exam. I think it's called a certification exam or licensure exam that we have huh? to pass. So it's, there's a national exam, and then every state uh, grants its own license. And in North Carolina specifically, massage therapy, physical therapy, physicians, chiropractors, uh, veterinarians, we're all part of the same legal statute. So all of our professions are regulated in the same bill or law. So we're all of, uh, we're all regulated by the state of North Carolina. And I know in order to treat a patient in another state, I have to be licensed in that state. Okay. Very good. Very good. So, um, when, when it comes down to, uh, comparing, with medical doctors, there's a lot of a lot of similarity, a lot of training, a lot of expertise, mm -hmm. and over the years, it looks like things have really been defined more rigorously. Where does chiropractic fit in? Is that related at all? I I just don't know, so I thought for the benefit of our audience, I'd ask you that question too. Yeah, it's a oh, it's a great question. Um, I actually wrote a blog post about this years ago because people would say, you know, Doctor Bauer, what do you do uh, that's different? Why is it different than a chiropractor? Um, there's a lot of overlap, I think, with physical therapists, chiropractors, and physical medicine and rehabilitation physicians and osteopaths. We all have a lot of overlap. Um, we, I think we, we all learn or trained in manipulation. We're all trained in soft tissue manipulation, joint uh, manipulation, as well as um, joint motion and rehab techniques. I believe that there's two big differentiators. Or one, it's our title, and two, it's our education lineage. Like, where did we come from, and what is our an initial... Um, lineage of education, chiropractors are great at joint manipulation. If, if I wanted to learn joint manipulation, I want to go learn it from a chiropractor. But why are we manipulating joints or why are we manipulating soft tissue? Those kind of initial philosophies are different from all the different professions. There is a lot of overlap. I, I do think we have a lot to learn from each other. But in all honesty, I've never been trained as a chiropractor, so I can't tell you exactly what a chiropractor 
does, but I, I think I know, um, what a physical therapist does is I look at how the body moves and I have, you know, a whole bunch of different tools in my toolbox to help the patient, um, get to their result. And and personally, I don't really care how I get them there as long as I can help them make improvement um, because pain is multifactorial. There's so many reasons we might be in pain. It's not as simple to say you need an exercise, you need a joint mobilization, you need a you know, dry needling technique. There's there's too many things going on in the human body. It's way too complex. Um, so I think hopefully that's a clear, non-clear answer as to what the big difference are. That, that is yeah. very good. Thank you. You know, sometimes it's not what you do in common, but some of the things you can't do. And right. there are limitations on surgery and writing prescriptions and things of that nature, right. depending on what field of, of the medicine world you live in. But mm-hmm. I think that really helps clarify things. So I think that was great. Um, Let's, let's kind of shift gears here. I think we have a good understanding, the size, the scope, the type of things that take place, but I think we've got some more things to uncover here. Currently at the University of Texas, Dallas, uh, we're actually engaged in a strategy class for our doctors and our clinicians and our administrators. And the fundamental definition of strategy, we're trying to get across what does strategy mean to this, this group of healthcare leaders. And well, just the fundamental, fundamental definition of strategy is to win. Right. You want to win. And winning a business means beating the competition. And you beat the competition by doing something entirely different or doing the same thing differently. It sounds to me, I want to understand what you're doing with this PT cash. Are you doing something entirely different? Yes and no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, No, in that I'm just trying to help patients in the best way possible. And I think that's what we're all here for is to how do we help people? When I was in my second clinical rotation, so I started my career as a massage therapist and I went to PT school because everyone told me, hey, Aaron, you're the first person to touch me where I hurt. I've been to see PTs, chiropractors, surgeons, et cetera, massage, and you're the first person to touch me where I hurt. Now I feel better. When am I going to be full all the way better? And I was like, I didn't know because I was a massage therapist and that's not our training. So I went to PT school, and on my first clinical rotation, I saw 43 patients one day. And I already knew that people needed more than 10 minutes of my undivided attention to get better, and I wasn't able to do that. And I decided, all right, I have to go out and do this my own way. I'm already charging $85 an hour. People are going to pay me 95 an extra $10 an hour because I'm Dr. LeBauer, the physical therapist now. Like, I just have to believe that. So what am I doing different? Like, nothing other than... I am helping patients directly, and I'm not participating in the triangular relationship that insurance wants us to participate in. It's kind of like having an argument with uh, your brother by talking to their spouse. (laughs) You know, it's like, that's 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 a a good metaphor. (laughs) Yeah, and no one likes that. I mean, if, if everyone listening has probably had some kind of personal relationship where they've gone around the person, not spoken directly to them, but they've gone around it to try to solve it. And that's um, what we call uh, being passive aggressive, right? It's like, you know, yeah. it's one of those ways. It's, I find the insurance relationship is like that because insurance tells me that I can't get paid to perform this treatment on this person's leg because I coded it as their leg, but someone else said it was their knee. And even though the code says leg or knee below the knee, it's just, it's ridiculous and arbitrary and Someone in Iowa named Jennifer shouldn't be deciding how I treat my patients or what they need. And I believe everyone on this call who's a medical provider has had this you know, frustration. And so what we're doing that's different is I'm marketing physical therapy services directly to our patients. Um, and we're contracting directly with our patients. Our patients get reimbursed, yes. Um, but Cash PT is this uh, kind of hashtag that uh, was used on Twitter a long time ago, and everyone who's a physical therapist knows what it means. And I started using it and um, used it to uh, signify, like, and how do I call my course, the course that I created, and the products I created is the Cash PT Toolkit and the Blueprint. And every physical therapist knows what it means, and it it, it s- triggers an emotional reaction, so they know whether they're for it or against it. Um, I'm for helping patients. And the best way I can do that is not by going through um, insurance channels. Okay, so let's go back and unpack this insurance situation a little bit deeper. Um, Because it kind of sounded like um, there's an insurance person standing over your shoulder as you're doing, you know, your your therapy work. Uh, what, What is problematic about, like, for example, if a person goes to see a physical therapist, 
Um, do they have to be referred by a doctor or can they go on their own? Do they have to have insurance? I mean, kind of where does that insurance thing really wrap itself around the, the consumer side of it? Yeah. So as a consumer, so number one, in all 50 states, uh, there's we have direct access to physical therapy, which means a patient can see a physical therapist first um, without needing a referral, a script or um, authorization. Um, for everyone except Medicare. Medicare is different. Medicare uh, beneficiaries need an authorization by a medical provider. But all 50 states aren't equal. So some states like Texas, it's a little bit more difficult or treatment might be limited to a certain, a shorter period of time. So that's one thing. It's access to physical therapy. Some insurance will uh, just arbitrarily say, we're not going to pay for this. Or we're only going to pay so much. But where it really affects the big scheme of things right now is physical therapists are graduating from schools with 150 to 250 even three hundred thousand dollars worth of debt and uh you're making eighty thousand dollars in outpatient orthopedics um, if you're really lucky and you're good at negotiating 120 or more in home health or skilled nursing that's hardly enough to pay down these huge loans and salaries are only decreasing because insurance is paying less and less and then what happens is a patient may need therapy and they come and they even pay you a copay, even if it's 50 bucks. My personal copay for physical therapy this year is $150 a visit. That's for any um, specialty practice, chiropractic, gastroenterology, cardiology, osteopathic, et cetera. My general practitioner, my, my family uh, physician is a 10 or $20 copay. So I go pay $50 for PT. That's still a lot of money. And then I go to my PT and I get my visits, and then the physical therapy business files the claim, and let's say Blue Cross or Aetna says, well, the usual and customary payment is $80. You don't get any extra. The copay is even higher than the usual customary. If it's lower, then the patient now owes the practice more. In any of these circumstances, what the organization, the business, or the hospital is billing insurance is generally higher than the copay and higher than the usual and customary. So patients go through therapy or treatment or a knee surgery, and three months later they get a bill that says, okay, great, you owe us this extra hundred or $3,000. And patients are like, wait a minute, I paid my copay, it should be free. And, and now the provider is um, the bad person <laughs> and it just creates a mess and it's, it creates a customer experience nightmare. It creates a service nightmare and it's really difficult for me to do my job when I know that if I provide this treatment, the insurance won't pay, but I can do this other treatment and the insurance will pay and the other treatment may not be necessary, but I know I can get paid for that. This episode is brought to you by the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, the definitive resource for healthcare management education in North Texas. The center is based in the Naveen Jindal School of Management at the University of Texas at Dallas. It plays a unique role in training the next generation of healthcare leaders to meet local, regional, and national demands. The Jindal School uses its strengths in accounting, administration, finance, marketing, and information systems to educate highly qualified personnel for healthcare administration and executive leadership positions. The center is home to seven healthcare leadership and management programs, including undergraduate and graduate programs, as well as executive programs for physicians and working professionals. For more information, visit us online at jindal.utdallas.edu forward slash healthcare. Okay, so if I'm a patient and I come to you, we're not talking insurance ever. It's just going to be cash, right? Yeah, we're going to talk insurance. Almost everyone asks about insurance. So all of our patients have insurance, uh, or probably 90% of our patients have, 95% of our patients have insurance. The ones that come to see us do, they have great insurance. They would just prefer for it to be a, a clear communication and know exactly what their health investment is going to be. We do provide our patients the information to file a claim through their health insurance. Some of the people I work with, some of the practice owners I work with, will actually file the claim on their beha- on their patient's behalf, much like most dentists do um, in the United States. Is they'll they're out of network, but they're uh, they'll file the claim, and that's really you can consider what we do is we're just out of network. I personally, in my practice, we don't file claims on behalf of our patients. 
Most of our patients at that point don't really care because their co-pays and deductibles are higher than what they would pay to come see us anyways. Okay. So um, the outcomes, I can see different scenarios where someone has insurance and you're going to get 24 visits to see a physical therapist and um, you're going to use all 24 of those because you've got those available. And it kind of Mm -hmm. comes to the question of the mission versus the margin. Um, right. Can can a practice today actually do a better job by spending more time uh, working with the patient, uh, trying to strive towards a better outcome, a value based approach, as opposed to just going through the machinery of next visit, next visit, next visit? Is there a difference in terms of the outcome and the relationship that you establish with with your um, with your patients? I believe there is, but I don't believe there's uh, any research that would uh, that would prove so. Because I do believe that there's some people out there who go to physical therapy who really just need to get out of the house and get off the couch and just moving. Like like I said before, like depending on what treatment it is, if you've got back pain, you know, it's gonna go away if you do nothing. But can I get it to go away faster or can I get you to an activity that you weren't able to do um, with confidence um, sooner or if you weren't able to all? I, I absolutely I believe that. Do I need to see you one-on-one? I don't, but for some more complex issues, it helps to have the time to take people through a full body um, movement exam and diagnosis to know where the problem's coming from. And like I said, I think it's dependent on the type of problem people have, but if if I feel rushed even early on, I can't even recommend our group program or our one-on-one program. I'm just... Uh, treating everyone like a body part and not a person. Okay, so you market directly to patients, not to physicians. Mm-hmm. So why don't you go deeper and tell us about the Cash PT Blueprint? You're out yeah. there helping other people understand and inspiring other healthcare providers to start their own business. Is that is that your mission? Yeah, my mission is to my mission is really to help 100 million people avoid unnecessary surgery and expensive imaging, and how I'm going to do that is by helping 55,000 physical therapists learn how to create a business and scale their time and income by, you know, marketing directly to patients. And because I, I can't do it myself. And so how do we do that? It's a, the cash PT blueprint is um, a course and, and a companion. I've got a book as well um, that goes with the course. And I built it because I had so many people asking me, Aaron, how did you build your business? How do I do that too? And um, I just floated this idea out. I said, hey, if I put together this program and it went through the the anatomy of a cash practice and what it looks like, um, how to get a business off the ground, how do we deal with Medicare and HIPAA, how do you go about marketing to patients, how do you transition from an in-network to out-of-network business? And I I said, hey, would you guys be interested in doing it? And had enough people say yes and 25 people enrolled. And that was when we launched it seven years ago. The main thing that we're doing is I'm taking people who didn't go to school to own a business, they went to school to help people, and I'm giving them the tools they need to build a business, whether it's just for themselves or to scale to multiple locations, and to serve patients in the best way that they know how. And the marketing strategies that we're doing are marketing strategies that healthcare isn't using. And people in healthcare are they're doing marketing much like Coca-Cola, Merck, and Pfizer. It's like, hey, we're here. Hey, we're great. Come see us. And people are like, yeah, but I don't need physical therapy. Uh, you only get that after surgery or you only get that if you're an athlete. And what we're doing is using words and descriptions to help general public understand that physical therapy is an option and opioids aren't the solution. Or, you know, like you don't need to wait two weeks to go see your physician and get an MRI physical therapy uh, is something that can help you right now. So when, when someone is graduating from, from the required education, become a physical therapist, where do they usually go? It sounds like you've got a, a great network of independent physicians, so to speak, independent um, mm-hmm. practitioners. Um, where, where, what are your choices? Do you go to, a, are there large firms or is this primarily, is this network of physical therapists primarily a lot of entrepreneurs across the country? Yeah, physical therapy industry is, there are not a lot of entrepreneurs that go into it. It's, I think you asked about the difference between chiropractors and physical therapists. I think chiropractors go in more often knowing that they're going to start a business or it's a different uh, mindset or kind of uh, almost like a 
personality. Physical therapists generally graduate and go work either in a hospital, skilled nursing, a home health, or just an outpatient orthopedic clinic, sometimes owned by physicians, sometimes owned by a corporation. Um, very few of them go to start their own business. Um, but I'd started mine right out of school and I've helped about three dozen uh, physical therapists personally start their business right out of school and hundreds others uh, that I don't even know about. And it's becoming more and more of an option. The more that, you know, I share about what I've done, uh, through my podcasts and books and courses and social media, the more that other physical therapists see that as a as a path that they can take to have a meaningful career, to not burn out and pay down their loans even faster than they could um, going and getting a job with someone else. So I think there's probably a connection here um, as a consumer. You know, there's a whole consumer-directed healthcare strategy underway. More and more mm-hmm. people are trying to learn how to get involved with their health. That way they can avoid the healthcare system. You know, if you start to get preventative and you start to think about wellness services and activities, you might have a better chance of getting in front of some of these issues. And I know the health savings account concept, um, it's, it's very popular now. It's a high deductible health plan. So usually you're going to pay the first five or six thousand dollars before your insurance kicks in. And when you end up paying the first five or six thousand dollars, you become the payer. You are the self-payer. And you decide, you know, where you want to go and where are you going to get your service and how you're going to be treated. And and for years, I had a high deductible health plan. And if I went to a dermatologist and I'd walk in and I'd say, hey, I need to see the doctor. I've got a couple little things here, need attention on my my arm or my hand. And um, they'd say, all right, do you have insurance? And I'd say, no, I'm a self-payer. And they'd say, okay. And that's where the conversation would stop for them. I would say, so what is the fee to deal with this situation today? And they say, we don't know. We'll have to kind of figure it out. Well, I need to figure it out before I go with you. So here I am bargaining, so to speak, for my service. Now, it's not a craniotomy or something. I mean, it's, it's not a life-threatening condition. It's just, you know, one of those off-the-shelf type services that you need. And I found that you could go in there and the doctor would say, hey, $65 cash deal. Okay. And I, I do the deal that way. And I found that more and more doctors would be more receptive to that. And, and why would I do that? Because I wanted to manage that cash payment I was making. And I would think that if you had a health savings account, that would work really nice in a way of paying for physical therapy treatment. It would. And we did. And I think the way the insurance regulations run in each state, I th- we stopped seeing a lot of um, people with HSAs, and maybe it's also, you know, the corporations here in town, and some of them have changed uh, probably their health plans. But yes, there are a lot of people that are aware of what healthcare costs. But there's so many people, um, their patients, that uh, expect it to be uh, included with their monthly insurance premiums, and physicians and providers that have no idea what the cash rate would be, or even they'll turn away people who are just willing to pay cash <laughs> and because it's not uh, something that's typical and normal. And um, I do think that change is coming. People are becoming better healthcare consumers. But I think that we've trained everyone to believe that uh, their date of birth and uh, who their insurance provider is is the most important thing about them. And I think that that's sad. <laughs> yeah, it's really your zip code. That, that probably has more to do with your health than anything nowadays. Yeah, so absolutely, Aaron, I've joined. I've joined the longevity economy. I'm at that mm-hmm. age now where I can say I'm part of the longevity economy. And so the speculation is, if you go to the MIT Age Lab and other sources, Age Wave, uh, they're indicating that a baby born today, like my most recent granddaughter, will live could live to 150 years old. Wow. But wow. for, for the grandfather, not unexpected for me to live uh, into my late 90s or even into the hundreds. And I would think that marketplace would be huge for physical therapy. Do you do anything at all that targets that particular segment of the population? You mean people older, older than the age of 65? I didn't want to say it that way, but yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. And like for our clinic specifically, you know, our target uh, market is like a 35 to 65. Um, we do have quite a few people who um, are Medicare beneficiaries. I think um, there's a lot of people and a lot of people I work with that target uh, people as who are older adults. 
if there was one thing that people need, my I mean, I'm 47, so anywhere from my age to older, it's to not only um, be strong, but to have good balance. And how do we have good balance is through strength. And one of the biggest fears that a lot of people, or I wouldn't say people, the internet, the news media, and physicians providers is that old people are fragile and frail. Um, and we should go easy on someone because they're older. Actually, we need to we need to actually you know push them harder because it takes longer to for your body to adapt and to recover. And we need to continue building strength. And because strength training, kettlebells, and yoga are how I'm going to be able to cut my own toenails when I'm 95. You know, Apple has just introduced their the latest version of their their watch, and along with that is Fit Plus, which features a whole mm-hmm. bunch of things like Pilates and and yoga, and you know, so does Peloton. There's a lot of people out there. I think that there's um, an opportunity there to direct people to find a physical therapist to get involved. How do, how do you find a physical therapist today? Is there an easy way? Like I said earlier, most people don't realize that you can just go find one on your own. You don't have to go see a doctor and have surgery first. Mm-hmm. So how do you recommend people to find a physical therapist? That's a great question. And yes, you can absolutely find a physical therapist. The best thing to do is if you know someone who's been to physical therapy, who's had a great experience, I think that's probably the best, like just like going out to eat at a good restaurant. The next best thing would be to just search Google and read the reviews, look and see. And I would look for an independent physical therapy practice because generally they'll have, you'll, you'll have a better experience in a smaller business than a large corporate or, you know, hospital owned business. It's just a part of the cog. It's a cog in the wheel rather than the wheel. Then there's some directories that are really uh, great and thorough. Uh, there's two. There's one that's called everypt.com. Um, it's a directory of uh, independent physical therapists in the United States that's for patients. I've built a directory for providers uh, to find other out-of-network and cash-based practice owners called the Cash PT directory. But in general, what you should look for is someone that, I was just writing this down the other day, someone who can talk to you on the phone first, whether it's the physical therapist or you know the patient coordinator, and set up a time to meet with you. Um, and in your first visit, look through your whole body, not just look at the body part that's hurting or injured, and talk to you about your goals and have the time to spend with you to figure out exactly what you want and need. Because just throwing treatments and care at someone because it's their shoulder that's the problem isn't always the solution. And many people feel like, oh, I can get that at CVS down the street myself. And so, It's just about going out and searching and understanding. The last thing I'll say about this is not all physical therapy and air quotes, physical therapy is the same. What I've heard that's sad is people say, well, physical therapy didn't work. Well, it's not physical therapy is not a modality. It's a, um, it's so, um, there's so much variety that it was the experience and relationship you had with that physical therapist that didn't meet your needs at that time in, in your life. That person might be able to help you later, or maybe there's someone else in their practice or another practice or approach that's going to help you. Physical therapy isn't an event, isn't a modality, and healing is not an event. Healing is a process. Well, you brought up an interesting topic here, uh, virtual health, telehealth, uh, mm-hmm. that due to the pandemic we've all been involved with has become you know much more popular, even um, CMS. All the different insurance groups have taken a different view on um, telehealth. Uh, I would think that would be a really good enabler, like you said, have a phone conversation. Are there things that you can do in terms of providing insights and service via like an iPad, an iPhone, a, a digital device? Absolutely. As long as I can, um, you know, one, talk to someone. I mean, helping my friends for years just on phone calls. Um, but if I can talk to you and using pattern recognition, understand what might be happening, have, you know, I can send you videos and say, Hey, try this. Now I can meet you on zoom and watch you move. And if I can identify where the root problem is, I don't have to actually touch you to get you better. I technically just need to be licensed in your state. And so there's a lot of things that we can do. And a lot of, uh, what we do as physical therapists is more than just touching patients. It's education and movement, uh, movement as medicine, but I can even send you a Theracane or rumble roller, um, or have you pick it up at our, uh, at our office or drop it by your house. If I need to only see you on video, which we did during the pandemic where we couldn't have people in. And so now we have a a mix, but it is, it's, it's just like so many things. The internet has opened 
us up. Like we're getting calls from New Zealand and Europe and you know California for people who've seen us on YouTube and and seen our blogs and other videos and other places. It's pretty amazing. That is incredible. I'm going to put you in the category of disruptive innovation, right up there <laughs> with Amazon and and Walmart and others who are finding different ways to meet the needs and goals for a healthier. Um, environment here. So this has been a great conversation. We've been with Dr. Aaron LeBauer, the author of the Cash PT Blueprint and the host of the Cash PT Lunch Hour podcast. So Aaron, thank you for taking time. I think we get a lot of knowledge here and we have a whole new perspective and view on what physical therapy is and how it can help us. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Business of Healthcare podcast. To learn more about the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, go to jindal.utdallas.edu slash healthcare.